Welcome to another study in the Word. This is Pastor Tom. Thank you for joining me today. It's a good day. And uh, we're going to do our third session here on the subject, a very controversial subject that we chose, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And uh, so I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, where um, this scripture has caused much controversy, as I was saying in our last session, uh, and risen, uh, really should not have, uh, because people have used this, this particular scripture, for all people. They've used it for uh, the way we should think, I suppose, about the Jews, the Gentiles, the all the people groups, the church, but Jesus was not referring nor speaking to all people here. Now, don't misunderstand me. Some of the things that Jesus, the, the things that Jesus said, were true in the context of answering a question under the Mosaic Law. The scripture here that we're going to read today and study through in Matthew chapter 19, it has some good things to share. For as all scripture does, some uh, some very good points and, and terms, but we cannot apply it to the church because the church is not under the Mosaic Law. So we need to stop doing that because when we do that. We've caused people heartache, confusion, unnecessary stress and strain. But let me say this before I start teaching. I am not an advocate of divorce in any way, shape, or form. Divorce is a horrible thing. The Bible says that God hates divorce. Doesn't dismiss, dislike it. He hates it. It's not God's original plan for marriage. It is not... Uh, if I can use this term, many times the best case scenario in any situation. Um, but with that being said, uh, is divorce always wrong? Is it always uh, just, you know, cut and dry? Is it, uh, well, if you get divorced, then you're committing adultery, as some people say, and they use this scripture. Is it like if you divorce, you can, you, 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 you can never remarry? Is that what he's really trying to say to us uh, in the church today? Uh, and I can, I can honestly tell you that what we need to do is interpret this marriage and divorce and remarriage thing, not only with the scriptures that talk about it, but also with the law of love. Because I'm here to tell you, every situation that you face when talking about marriage divorce and remarriage is a difficult thing because every single person and situation may be different. And so the advice given by clergy or by anybody else maybe needs to be thought through more. Now, in some denominations, it's flat. That's the way it is. And that's the way we believe. If you don't want to believe that, then you're out the door or whatever. Uh, divorce in some denominations has literally become the unpardonable sin which is, to me, ridiculous. And um, it's, it can be very hurtful. Divorce in, in itself is hurtful enough. I mean, how many people have been hurt by divorce? How many children? How many parents? How many grandparents? Just the, uh, how many family members? Just in generally speaking, divorce causes issues all over the place. Divorce causes issues between the former husband and wife. It causes issues with the children and the spouses if they remarry new spouses, stepkids. You've got uh, financial situations that, that move into divorce. Divorce is a horrible thing. Divorce is to be avoided at all times if possible. But on the other hand, is it always out of the will of God? Just Is it always wrong? Is it always sinful? Is it always something that when you do it, you you have a stigma on you for the rest of your life? And I always ask people, I said, now look, you know, what possible sin is there other than the sin unto death or the, uh, the impartable sin? What is there in the Bible anywhere that says a sin cannot be forgiven? Even if you're calling divorce a sin, which many times it is, it's selfishness between uh, couples. Isn't that something God can forgive? Isn't that something that the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away? I just think that when we when we when we take certain scriptures like this and make them the sum saying of all that there is about marriage, we're putting ourselves in a position to where 
we're saying something and representing something that God is not. And uh, that can be dangerous. Now, let's go here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out of the New King James Bible, verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1, excuse me, in Matthew. Now, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea behind the Jordan. And a great multitude followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him. Now, when you're interpreting scripture, here's what you have to do. Who's he talking to? The Pharisees also came to him. Well, who were the Pharisees? They were the Jewish leaders, the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people at the time. They were testing him. So this is, they're doing something here to try to get Jesus to, one way or another, uh, break their commandments, their law, whatever, misinterpret something. They're trying to trick him. And they said to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? All right. Uh, trying to trick him. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read? Now, stop right there. Have you not read? What could Jesus possibly be referring to? Well, the only thing he could have been referring to at that particular moment is the Old Covenant. There was no New Covenant. Even Matthew hadn't been written yet. The Gospels hadn't been written yet. The, the, the letters to the church hadn't been written yet. So he is referring to uh, the Old Covenant, and he's referring, in, in this case, to the Mosaic Law. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So when somebody leaves their father and mother and they're married, they become one flesh. Now, Christians, when they leave their father and mother, they're already one spiritually, because we're all one spiritually. We're, ones, we're one in the Lord. So they leave their fathers and their mothers they then enter into the marriage covenant, and ideally, the woman would be a virgin, the man would be a virgin. When they enter into that covenant in marriage, both being a virgin, there is a covenant cut between them where they become one flesh, and the hymen is broken, and there's some blood involved and all that. That is, was God's original plan. That's the, God's best plan. But unfortunately, human beings, you know, we're, we're sinners. We make mistakes. Sometimes we do things we shouldn't do, and, and, and that's why Jesus had to come. And so, but still, even if we are not virgins when we marry, all right, still, we're one, if we're Christians, we're one in the Lord. We come together. We become one flesh when we, have the, when we consummate the marriage. And that's something we do. It's not something God does, something we do. He made us one. We don't do that. But when we become one flesh, we do that. All right? But marriage then becomes then a long struggle, if I can use this term, a long struggle to become one in the realm of the soul. That is where people struggle mightily in marriage, the emotional part of it, the soulish part of it, the getting along part of it, and all that. And I, I'll talk about that just for a second so you can start thinking in certain terms. But we go on here. It says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It doesn't say they're one soul. They're one flesh, they're one spirit, but they're not one soul. So there's that's where the rub's going to come in. They are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Well, that's best. If you're going to come and and in any manner of marriage, whether you be a Jew or a Gentile or even a Christian, it's God's best that uh, um, whom God has joined together, you do not separate. But I want you to understand something. Does God really join an unbeliever and an unbeliever? Well, not really in the sense of, of what we're talking about it for the church. That it's really not even his idea of marriage. Um, and, and so anybody outside of the church you have to understand, God is not, it's total blessing cannot be on it because they're not believers. They're not in the family of God. 
Now, I'm not saying they can't get married. I'm not saying they shouldn't get married. I'm not saying uh, that at all. But what I'm trying to get you to see is that Christians are a whole different group of people. We are new creations. And so God's idea about marriage in the church should be really the highest form of marriage. And the Gentile world cannot, cannot, and it doesn't have the love of God in it. So it can't raise up to that that aspect, the Jewish world either. So understand that. Now, uh, verse 7, they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put away her, put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. In other words, it wasn't God's original plan from the beginning to, to, to have some guy just be able to, you know, throw his wife away because he doesn't think she's uh, 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 young and pretty enough anymore. And this is what they were doing. So Jesus is going to bring this right back on them. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, committeth adultery. And whoever marries her, who is a, a divorced, commits adultery. Now, according to the Mosaic law, this would be the case. All right? And that's what you need to understand. Jesus is simply answering them a question and saying, look, when you guys do what you do by just taking a, a, a divorce a letter and just write it out and throwing away the, the girl, really what you're, what you're doing is you're causing a, 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 a sexual immorality to take place, a, an adultery to take place. You're not really you know, uh, 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 you know, treating this woman with any kind of respect. You're just throwing her away. And God is not, uh, um, you know, sanctioning that type of thing. And so he answers the question. His disciples came to him and said, if such is the case of the man with his wife, is it better not to marry? But he said, all cannot accept this saying. Now I want you to understand, all can accept that saying. I can't accept that saying because I'm not uh, living under the Mosaic law. Neither are you. But he says it's for those to whom it has been given, which is the the, the Mosaic people under, that he was talking to under the Old Covenant. The New Covenant had not started yet. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And these are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept this, accept it. So there was people that were born without the ability to marry. There was people that actually uh, were castrated for the kingdom of God in the early days and became that way. Paul's saying not everybody can accept the fact that marriage is, uh, you know, uh, not necessary to have a happy life. And he makes that point. Now, when you read this, if you read it in the light of the law of love, you have to understand some of the things Jesus said don't wouldn't make any sense that way. As an example, the only reason somebody could marry a uh, divorce is for fornication or sexual immorality. Is that true? Is that the only reason now? Is Jesus making a law for the church? Uh, um, the only reason that somebody, somebody, the only reason the Bible gives, or the only reason there could be for somebody to divorce his wife or her husband is because of sexual immorality. Is that the case? I think you can see the fallacy in that, of trying to apply that that way for the, for the New Testament church. Well, of course it wouldn't be. There are sometimes situations that may arise between a husband and a wife that are married, even in a Christian marriage, that may, you may have to look at it from a different standpoint than just Matthew chapter 19. Paul begins to talk about some of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, Paul, who is, who, is he, who is he writing to in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is writing his letter to none other but than the church. All right? So Jesus was writing to the Jews about the, uh, under the Mosaic law, the Moses law there. He was not addressing all people groups. He was addressing the question they asked under the law. He addressed it. For us as Christians to take that and try to apply it to Christianity and to us in the body of Christ is, is wrong. There are parts of that that would uh, certainly fit in. We become one flesh when we're married. And uh, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That would be a good principle. There's other things. 
but, you know, it's a good principle, but it, but it doesn't really relate to us. It's not something that we can use to, de to determine whether or not, uh, you know, we should divorce or remarry. You see what I'm saying? So when you do that, you put yourself in a position to where this is the way it is. And if you break this, then this is what it says. This is what it says. And they got people now, okay, when churches do that, they got them divorcing for whatever reason, maybe even legitimately, okay, but then never being able to marry again. What's that going to cause? If nothing else, it's going to cause some problems sexually and every other way. And then, you you know, you got the little children. Brother Hagen went all over all that. What could, what would compassion do? What would love do? Is that a... Is that what love would do is to say you can't even pastor this church anymore because your your wife left you for another man? Is that compassion to, to denominate our denominations who believe that way, being compassionate toward um, these people that have been scarred and hurt by divorce? And sometimes uh, the, the divorce is not their fault. It, it, was, it didn't have anything to do with it. Like the young man who was so naive, he didn't know that his wife was a prostitute running around with other 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 men and he found out later was that his fault did he sin in the situation i'd have to say no he didn't he didn't have anything to do with the situation so if he didn't have anything to do with that situation it was totally her her idea to do that that is is that sin to be held against him is her sin to be held against him of course not some of these things just are common sense again now 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I want you to hold your place there, and let's go to Matt, uh, John chapter 13, and we'll come right back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So when we're talking about the law of love here, in marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we need to, we need to understand something. Only Christians can operate in the law of love, because only Christians have the agape love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. So it's ludicrous, in my opinion, for the world to even, I mean, to even speak to the world and say, well, you should do things this way, uh, like the Christian world does, is stupid to me. You know, it, 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 yes, there's some moral, good moral principles that you can get. You can get them from the Old Testament, too. Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not kill, steal, you know, so on, murder. But when you're trying to blend the Gentile world or of sinners with the Bible, you're going to have problems. And, 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 and we can see that. We can see that that, that that was what was going on there. And what many churches have done today is exactly that. They've taken something that was meant for the Jews or the, uh, for, for that particular people, and they swing it over into the church, try, you know, trying to make a point that Jesus said this for all people when he didn't. Now, in, in, in John chapter 13, um, if you look down at verse 34, very famous uh, a verse of scripture, Jesus makes it clear here, and I wanted to cover this because it's very important uh, uh, for us to understand this. So verse 34, a new commandment I give to you. Now, a lot of people uh, would say there are no new commandments in the New Testament or, or delivered from the Old Testament. We don't have any more commandments like that. Well, that's not true. We have a new commandment he has given to us, that you agape one another, as I have agape you. That's the agape love of God. That's what the Greek says, that you also agape one another. By this, all men shall know that you are my disciples, if you agape one another. Now, let's take that. Let's take that. Let's say we have two Christians coming together that have the agape love of God on the inside of them. They are new creations. They have that love shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. And these two new Christians come together and they are married. They are already one in the Lord. The sinner can't claim that, but they can. And so they're married before God. They commit to one another in covenant, okay? And they come into this love marriage, this love commandment. Well, if you love somebody and you love your spouse, you're not going to commit adultery. If you love them, then you're not going to, you know, uh, murder them. Or you're not going to beat them up. You're, you can go down a long list. So you have two people coming together that are Christians into this agape love. All right. And now they commit to one another in covenant. And they're going to spend the rest of their lives, they come together, they become one flesh because they have their sexual relations, that's becoming one flesh. 
Now they're going to spend the rest of their life, their lives dealing with not only the flesh that does things that causes issues, but also the unrenewed mind, or I, you could put it this way, the yet unrenewed mind or things in the mind or the soulish realm that they have to learn how to deal with in marriage. You have two different people here. You've got one person over here that has a background, set of experiences, rules that they have learned. Uh, they have different uh, cultures, as me and my wife did. They have different thinking on certain things. Uh, maybe they talked about some of these issues. Maybe they didn't. Maybe one wants children more than the other does. And you've got all of these issues that they have to work out in the soulish realm, certainly not one soulish in their souls. So there, it, that's where the rub comes in. The rub comes in marriage, in emotions, in uh, not meeting the emotional needs of the individual. Most of the time, that's the major issue uh, in marriage is those things, a lack of communication, all these type of things. But when you have two people get together and they are committed to walk in love toward another, that will be overcome. God's love will overcome all of these obstacles, even though they're difficult and challenged. You're committed to the marriage. You're committed to make it work. If both of the family or both of the people in the marriage are committed to walk in love, the new covenant of love in marriage, then they will have a successful marriage. The problem is even Christians at times decide as an act of their will not to walk in love. And when that happens, then you can have adultery. You can have uh, an affair. You can have this thing or that thing. Christians start acting selfishly sometimes, just like the world does. And so uh, sometimes, you know, you can have somebody who doesn't pay any attention to their spouse. That's not love. You can, you can have somebody that, that uh, doesn't meet the emotional needs of the spouse, doesn't know how to, hasn't learned to. That's not love. So you have all these issues that rise up. The difference is this. I want you to make a note. If both the husband and the wife, when they leave their parents, they become one with, they're one with the Lord, so they become one together in marriage. They commit to the marriage. If both of these people will walk in love as the cardinal rule of their life, they will never, when two people walk in love together in marriage, they will never, ever, ever end in divorce. Ever. Now, what happens if one person only does that and the other doesn't? You have a wide range of scenarios that can take place. Let's link this through together. Because what I'm telling you is true. What happens if uh, if uh, both spouse won't walk in love? Well, you're just going to have a mess. And probably it's going to end in a divorce. Because the flesh and hell and the devil and everybody else is going to try to help you get a divorce. They're going to try to ruin your family. The thief comes to, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So where the problem comes in normally is not issues. It's not conflict. You're going to have issues. You're going to have conflict. You're going to have all kinds of things. You're going to have disagreement in marriage. You're going to have different ways that you'd like to do things. But the, but the family that pursues God's love and lets love lead them, lets the Holy Spirit lead them, and, and lets the law of love govern their family, will make it through those things and eventually overcome them and become stronger. Well, Pastor Tom, how do you know that? Well, number one, my marriage is like that. We had to work through a lot of issues over the years, still working, but because we're committed to the law of love, we don't just run off and divorce one another. We work through the issues no matter how challenging they are, okay? Not condemning anybody who's been through a divorce. I'm just saying we are both committed to the love walk in our lives and to become one soul. We're almost there. I mean, Stella and I, it's funny because I know what she's thinking and she knows what I'm thinking half the time before we even say anything. I mean, that's how far that's come uh, in, th in 41 or 38 years of marriage. So you see what I'm saying? You can progress in this and that's very simply the, the, the easiest way to give it to you. But when the church says, okay, 
if you divorce and you're committing adultery or when, when they, t they put us back under the law, that's when you're going to get a lot of problems because when you put people back under the law, they're going to sin. They're going to do things because you can't keep the law. You see what I'm saying? You cannot keep some rules and regulations and law made from the uh, old covenant. Uh, that's the whole, the, that, the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And so grace and mercy and love make up the difference on these things. So remember that. Now, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, is interpreting marriage and marriage in the light of love. That's why it seems like it contradicts Jesus, but it doesn't. It, it, he's writing to the church. He's not writing to the Messianic Jews that are asking him a question. And it is very important, as you go through this, to understand he's, just, he, he's sharing what we should do as believers. Some guidelines here. In verse 1, Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Let me stop and say this. So he, see now Paul is saying in marriage, all right, it's not good, fornication is a dangerous thing, sex outside of marriage is a dangerous thing, so... God has provided a way for you to stay away from that, and it's called marriage, all right? It's not good for a man to touch a woman sexually in, outside of marriage or, uh, you know, adultery or any of that. It'll get you in trouble every time. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality or because there's a temptation toward that in human beings, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. And then the law of love would dictate to us, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Don't withhold that. When you start withholding that, that becomes an issue. Okay? The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have his authority over his own body, but the wife does. In the law of love, you're not selfish. Your life is not your own. You're bought with a price, and you are now called to serve one another. The husband is called to love his wife. The wife is called to love her husband and submit to her husband. You know, it's really interesting because the Bible talks a lot about love and it calls all Christians to walk in love. But listen to this. It's very interesting to me that God puts an emphasis on the husband loving the wife and then the wife to submit to her own husband, which a lot of people have a hard time with that, but that simply means to take a subordinate role in the in the family life. But when it talks about the woman loving her children and loving her, or wife loving her children and loving her husband, and another word is used, it's a friendship love. So God knows that what the man needs when it comes to love is more of a friendship love, and the wife is going to have to have that agape love. So the man has really, or the husband in the situation has the higher um, responsibility because he's the head of the home to make sure his, his wife and then his children are taken care of that way. Well, I've run out of time. <laughs> now, when we start talking about this law of love, you're going to see that this law of love frees us on both ends. This law of love frees us to live in marriage in harmony and peace and joy. And marriage can be a wonderful thing. And we grow as we grow in marriage together. And it, it's really God's best for us to stay married, to work through our issues, our problems, so on and so forth. Both of us walking in love, that'll get the job done. But on the other hand, if somebody in a married situation, your spouse, somebody does not walk in love, what can the other spouse do? Sometimes they do weird stuff. Christians do weird things. A Christian can commit adultery. We'll talk about that. A Christian can do this, that, and the other thing. A Christian can abandon its children in marriage and just run off. We've seen it before. I've seen it as a pastor quite a few times now over the years. What's somebody supposed to do in a situation like that? Are they bound for the rest of their lives to have to stay unmarried? We will talk about that as we go. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. If you do, please share it. Please subscribe. Please share it. And, um, 
subscribe to our videos please also by the way go to our website faithalifefellowship.org there you can we have free seminars and um you can go through all those seminars and learn a lot. If you if you include our free seminars on our website, both YouTube pages we have, this one and FAF Video 1, which is our, our church one, I tell you what, it is a Bible school because I go into great detail on these, as you can tell, concerning different Bible subjects and doctrines. And, you know, the millennial generation today, a lot of you guys that are younger, you really need to listen to the verse-by-verse -verse commentaries and all the things that I'm providing uh, to be able to get to really know the Word of God, because the Word of God is not being, in some places, emphasized the way it should be in churches today. Not all churches are like that, but many of them are. And so I'm trying to provide 41 years of intense study and spirit-filled life and experience as a pastor and leader uh, in, a church, in churches and, and, and ministry. Everything I can muster to try to lay it down from now until I go home to be with Jesus and do it in various forms, whether it's YouTube or other forms, we can we can, can we'll, we'll just switch it over if we have to. But the whole point is, uh, there there should be enough teaching on there for anybody, no matter who they are, if they want to go through to get a good, solid, firm grasp of Bible understanding, and not just a basic Bible understanding, but an in-depth Bible understanding. So please let other people know about this. We love you. Remember this. Feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. Until next time, God bless you.